All right, it's a night. I'm already uh, well on my way, and we're gonna start reading The Cat Who Sang for the Birds by Lillian Jackson Braun. Book is dedicated to Earl Bettinger, the husband who, and that's all you get. Start with the first two chapters. At this point in time, I don't have a drinking game decided because I don't know what kind of tropes this book is gonna have. The general drinking tropes are just, if it's cringe, drink. If it's really, really funny, drink. If you think it's not good enough, you aren't a drinker. I don't know. Okay, Papi. I'm here, I'm here too. I know. <laughs> We're both here. <laughs> I'm not reading to myself. I'm not a loser. It's not just me and my cats reading a cat book, like the cat Type. freak that I am. <laughs> and the thousand mosquitoes that hover above my head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Chapter one. Following an unseasonable thaw and disastrous flooding, spring came early to Moose County, 400 miles north of everywhere. In Pickaxe City, the county seat, flower boxes on Main Street were blooming in April. Birds were singing in Park Circle, mosquitoes were hatching in the bogs, and strangers were beginning to appear in the campgrounds and on the streets of downtown. Stop. You gotta drink the mosquitoes. That's true. We've got too many of them. He literally just said it. And there's one in my drink. It's bad. Already wanted to drink? Seriously? Okay. Cool. Fantastic. Extra protein. Mm. <laughs> One afternoon in late May, a brown van pulled into a parking lot alongside a small green sedan and a man wearing a black jersey slipped out of the driver's seat. He glanced furtively to the left and right and leaving the motor running, he opened the tailgate. Then he unlocked the trunk of the sedan and quickly transferred something from his vehicle to the other, after which he lost no time in driving away. An out-of-towner, witnessing the surreptitious maneuver, might have described him as a Caucasian male, middle-aged, about six feet to two. What is with these books? And oh they're extremely... I mean, okay, that is a trope. If the person is at no, no, I mean, or above... Um, okay, if a, man, if a man is, above, is man. at or above six feet anything, drink. Because how many men do you encounter in your daily life who are actually above or at six feet? I know, I sure that. fucking don't. Tattoo shops. Tattoo shops are twig people. They're just long pencils. <laughs> About six feet two, with slightly graying hair, and an enormous pepper and salt mustache. Ooh, see, we're really interesting with Sexy. writing. Instead of saying salt and pepper, we said pepper and salt. Oh, man, this is gender nonconforming. <laughs> On the other hand, any resident of Pickaxe, Population, 3,000. Hey! You can't drink to this, but I can. It's the population of my city. <laughs> Would have recognized him immediately. He was James McIntosh Quillerin, columnist for the Moose County something, and, by a fluke of fate, the richest man in northeast central United States. He had reason to be furtive about the parking lot caper, in Pickaxe, everyone knew everyone's business and discussed it freely on the phone, on the street corners, and in the coffee shops. Now I'm going to stop myself there because I honestly don't understand this trope. I've lived here for almost a month, and I can tell you for a fact that no one gives a shit about nothing. Nope. Depending upon, like, <laughs> you must have to live somewhere specifically strange because no one gives a fuck. Individuals would say, it's nice that Polly Duncan got herself such a rich boyfriend. She's been a widow for a heck of a long time. That green sedan she drives, he gave it to her for a birthday present. Wonder what she gave him. He does her grocery shopping at Toodles Market while she's at work and puts the stuff in her car. Makes you wonder why they don't get married. Then she could quit her job at the library. The sidewalk gossip knew it all. Uh. They knew that Quillerin had been an important crime reporter down below, as they called the megacity south of the 49th parallel. They knew that something sinister had wrecked his career. They would see, Then he come up here, by golly, and fell kerplunk into all them millions. Talk about luck. 
More like billions, if you ask me. But he deserves it, nice fella. Friendly, nothing highfalutin about Mr. Q. You can say that again. Pumps his own gas. Lives in a... Pumps his own gas? <laughs> I guess That's it is. Pretty hot. I, I mean, I guess it is like late '90s, so people actually still kind of did that as a job. Well, yeah, but what? <laughs> Pumps his own gas, lives in a barn with two cats, and danged if he don't give most of his dough away. The truth was that Quilleran was bored with high finance, and he had established the Kling Klingingschoen, Klingingschoen, Kling. However you want to say that foundation to distribute his wealth for the betterment of the community. This generosity, plus his genial personality, had made him a local hero. For his part, he was contented with small town life and his relationship with the director of the library. Still, his brooding gaze carried a burden of sadness that made the good folk of Moose County ask each other questions. One Thursday in May, he went to the newspaper office to hand in a copy of his column, straight from the quill pen. Then he stopped at the used bookstore and browsed for a while, buying a 1939 copy of Nathaniel West's book, The Day of the Locust. At Tootle's Market, he asked Grandma Tootle to help him select fruit and vegetables for Polly. These he transferred to her car on the library parking lot, hoping to avoid notice by the ubiquitous busybodies. That touchy business completed, he was driving home when he heard sirens and saw flashing lights heading south on Main Street. With a journalist's instinct, he followed the emergency vans, at the same time calling the city desk on the car phone. Thanks, Quill, the city editor said, but we were tipped off earlier, and Roger's already on his way there. The speeding vehicles, including Roger's gray van, turned into the street leading to the high school. By the time Quilleran arrived on the scene, the reporter was snapping newspaper photos of a gruesome accident in front of the school. Scattered about were the remains of two wrecked cars, victims covered with blood, broken glass everywhere. One passenger appeared to be trapped inside the worst wreck. Horrified students crowded the school lawn, restrained by a yellow cordon of police tape. Ambulance crews were in action, a drunk driver was hustled to a patrol car. Stretcher barriers rushed one serious case to a medical helicopter that had landed on the school parking lot. Meanwhile, groans and cries rose from the shocked onlookers as they recognized their bloodied classmates. Finally, the rescue squad's medical cutters, or metal cutters sliced through the car body to reach the trapped victim, who was taken away in a body bag. At that point, the principal's voice on the public address system ordered all students to return to the building at once and report to the auditorium. Quilleran, watching the rescue with mounting wonder, stroked his mustache in... <laughs> God, God, drink, drink for that. Any time a mustache is stroked. That yeah, is yeah, a yeah, drink. Yeah. Hey, Any trope. I just, I just did it. I did it I'm not saying it. we don't all do it. Hey, you don't even have a mustache. I don't have one at because I, I don't want to have one necessarily, but I have stroked my beard. I'm saying facial hair gets stroked if it exists. Oh yeah. I'm saying you you <laughs> don't have women with long hair running their fingers through their hair. Yeah, but if yeah. a man has facial hair, it is stroked constantly. Constantly. <laughs> Quilleran, watching the rescue with mounting wonder, stroked his mustache in perplexity and beckoned to the reporter who had started packing his photo gear. Roger looked up. Hey, I like that black shirt, Quill. Where'd you get it? Never mind the shirt. What goes on here? You don't know? The reporter glanced around before saying in a confidential tone, mock accident, to discourage underage drinking. Tomorrow night's the spring fling. Yeah. Do people do that ever? Do you think it'll work? It should give them a jolt. Students got a sudden order to leave the building immediately because of contamination in the ventilation system. I got a little queasy myself when I saw the blood, and I knew it was fake. Quilleran huffed into his mustache. Now tell the truth, Roger. It would have fooled me if your desk man hadn't said the paper was tipped off earlier. What did he mean by that? We got a release on the story about an hour ago. 
The whole thing was a fantastic job of planning and secrecy. Got time for a cup of coffee at Lewis's? Sure. There's another assignment at 2.30, but it's only a kid's art show. I can be late. Roger headed for his van. Meet you there. Okay, so this is the unseen and unheard drinking game for those except me who's actually looking at the page. This writer enjoys, as my partner may notice, putting a paw print occasionally during the writing. So anytime I reach a paw print, it's, uh... Okay, this is lame. I can't think of anything better. It's time for a pooter. We're just going to call it that. It's like a shooter mixed with a paw. It's a pooter. So anytime there's a cat paw print, I'm just going to say, pooter! And if you don't get that, sucks for you. Now, I called it L Lewis's, but when it, you have a name spelled L-O-I-S, it's either Lewis, Lois, or Louise, because spelling doesn't fucking matter. So I'm going to just assume that we're being old style here and that it's going to be a female running a diner. And so I'm going to call it Lois from now on. Okay. That said, Lois's luncheonette. And with a name like luncheonette, if luncheon meat is not brought up at any fucking point in this book, I am going to sue. Lois's luncheonette, just off Main Street, was a shabby, shabby eatery that had been feeding downtown workers and shoppers for 30 years. Lois Inchpot, the loud, bossy, hard-working proprietor, served large portions of moderately priced comfort food to loyal customers who considered her a civic treasure. See, I didn't even read forward, and I was right. Drinking for my own correctness, because I know how to read things and situations, not books. I'm not illiterate. The restaurant was empty when the two newsmen arrived. What do you guys have? Lewis yelled through the kitchen pass-through. The lunch specials are off and we're low on soup. Just coffee. Quilleran called to her. Unless you have any apple pie left. One piece is all. Flip a coin. Roger said, you take it, Quill. I'd just as soon have lemon. He was a pale young man with a neatly trimmed beard, stark black against his unusually white complexion. A hey, racist. <laughs> a former history teacher. He had switched to journalism when the Moose County something was launched. He was married to the daughter of the second wife of the publisher. Nepotism in Moose County was not only ethically acceptable, but enthusiastically practiced. So, Quilleran began, how come I didn't know about this melodrama at school? More than anything else, he disliked being uninformed and taken by surprise. Who dreamed it up, anyway? Probably the insurance companies. What's so amazing, they were able to keep it under wraps in spite of all the different organizations and personnel involved. And in spite of our 3,000 nosy Nellies and congenital gossips, Quilleran added, all of Pickaxe knows I've started doing Polly's grocery shopping even though I slink around like a footpad. That's the price you pay for living in a crime-free, unpolluted paradise, the younger man said. What did you think of the kids who did the play acting? They're all students who've been affected in some way by drunk drivers. What did you think of their bloody makeup? It was done by paramedics from EMS. <laughs> they all did a convincing job, and I'll bet they actually enjoyed it. But will their efforts accomplish anything? I hope so. Everyone's been asking to sign a pledge not to drink at school parties. Exactly how it goes. I mean, like, you get, like, a sweet-ass wristband or something if you sign here. Yeah, you get a not-even-once wristband. Well, yeah, if you get a sweet-ass wristband, everybody gets it. <laughs> Louise interrupted with two plates of pie in one hand, two mugs of coffee in the other, and forks and spoons in her apron pocket. If you guys spill anything, clean it up. She ordered with swaggering authority. I just finished setting up for supper, and my help don't come on till 4.30. Yes, ma'am, Quilleran said with a show of meekness. To Roger, he put the usual question. Anything new at the paper? 
Well, there was some vandalism last night that would have made a sensational story, but... So much for your crime-free paradise, Quilleran interrupted. Yeah, well, at the editorial meeting this morning, there was the usual go-round. I know you news guys from down below were hipped on the public's right to know, but we have different ideas up here. If we reported the vandalism in any depth, we'd be A, boosting the perpetrator's ego, and B, encouraging copycats, and C, starting a witch hunt. So you decided in favor of censorship, Quilleran said to tease him. We call it small town responsibility. A flush came to Roger's pale face. He was a native of Moose County, and Junior Goodwinter, the young managing editor, was a fourth generation native. Arch Riker, the publisher, was a transplant from down below, reluctant to abandon his journalistic integrity. Quilleran had lived in the North Country long enough to appreciate both sides of the argument. What's this about a witch hunt? he asked. Well, in every small town, there's an element that's itching to be another Salem. Last night, somebody spray-painted the front of an old farmhouse with the word WITCH in big yellow letters, two feet high. An old woman lives there alone. She's in her 90s and kind of odd, but this neck of the woods is full of oddballs. Quilleran felt a tremor on his upper lip and tamped his mustache with his knuckles. Oh, my God. Tamped? Wait, wait. Tamp, tamp, tamp. Like, which farmhouse? The old Coggin place on Travelin' Road, right in back of your property. I know the house, but I've never met the occupant. Is she a dowser by any chance? Not that I'm aware of, Quilleran said. My column is Tuesday's paper was about dowsing. You know, sometimes called water witching. It's controversial down below. How do you feel about it? Most people around here wouldn't start to drill a well without hiring a dowser to pick the spot, Roger said. It sounds crazy, using a forked stick to locate underground water, but they say it works, so I don't knock it. Quill, how do you keep coming up with ideas for the quill pen? I would have run dry a long time ago. It's not easy, fortunately. I had a 10th grade teacher who taught me how to write a thousand words about anything or nothing. Talk about witches. That woman bewitched us with her big, round, watery eyes. Behind her back, we called her Miss Fisheye. But she knew her craft, and she knew how to teach. Every time I sit down at the typewriter to pound out another column, I mutter a thank you to Miss Fisheye. I wish I could have had that kind of impact on kids in my history class said the ex-teacher. Maybe you did. Maybe your students never told you. I never told Mrs. Fisher how I appreciated her, and now it's too late. I don't even remember her real name, and I doubt whether she's still alive. She was old when I was in 10th grade. You thought she was old? She was probably 30. True. Very true. Quilleran said, staring into his coffee mug. Say, Quill, I've been meaning to ask... What's that skinny bike I see you riding on Sandpit Road? A British Thanet, circa 1950. Collector's item. It was advertised in a bike magazine. It looks brand new. It's called a silver light. I can pick it up with my little finger. I believe Thanet was influenced by aircraft design. It's sure a sleek piece of work, Roger said. More coffee? Louise yelled from the kitchen. She knew Quilleran never said no to coffee. Made a fresh pot just for you, she said as she poured. Don't know why. I don't know why either, he said to her. I'm an underserving wretch, and you're a good soul with a kind heart and a sweet disposition. Bosh, she said, smiling as she waddled back to the kitchen. How's your family, Roger? Quilleran regretted he could never remember the names and ages of his friends' offspring, or even how many there were and which sex. They're fine. They're all excited about Little League Soccer. I'm coaching the team, believe it or not, the pickaxe pygmies. How are your cats? Roger was mortally afraid of cats, and it was an act of courage even to inquire about their health. 
Those fussy blue bloods are glad to be back in the barn after spending the winter in a condo. It cramped their royal style. I've just built a gazebo behind the barn so they can enjoy the fresh air and commune with the wildlife. Speaking of barns, Quill, I've got a great favor to ask. Roger looked at him hopefully. I'm the only reporter working weekends this month, and there's a breaking story Saturday afternoon, but that's when I'm off duty, bound to drive a van load of kids to the big game with the lockmaster Lily Putins. I need someone to cover for me. What's the assignment? Experience had made Quilleran wary of substituting. What's the barn connection? Well, it's not exactly as exciting as a three-alarm fire. It's in the metal storage barn at the Good Winter Farmhouse Museum. It's a dedication, an open house for the general public. Humph. Quilleran murmured. He remembered arriving in Moose County as a city-bred greenhorn from down below. Roger had been the first native to cross his path. Patiently and without ridicule, Roger had explained the threatening footsteps thudding across the roof after dark were those of a raccoon, and not a burglar. Also, I have to drink for raccoon, because I have a raccoon that sits around the house. If I'm drinking for skeeters, I'm drinking for coons. <laughs> the hair-raising screams in the middle of the night were not those of a woman being abducted, but a wild rabbit being seized by an owl. Well, I suppose I could handle it, he said to the anxious young reporter. Spot news for Monday, I suppose. Deadline Monday noon. Take pictures, probably front page. Gee, thanks, Quill. I really appreciate it. Roger looked at his watch. I've got to jump on my horse. You take off, I'll get the tab. The offer was not all magnanimity. At the cash register, it was possible to scrounge some turkey or pot roast for the Siamese. Do your spoiled brats eat codfish? Lewis inquired as she banged the keys on the old-fashioned machine. Tomorrow's special, fish and chips. Thank you. I'll consult them. He knew very well that Coco and Yum Yum turned up their well-bred noses at anything less than top-grade red sockeye salmon. Key. Drink for spoiled cats. And pooter. So drink again. If I come up with anything goddamn better, I'll figure it out. Returning home, Quilleran drove around the park circle, where Main Street divided into one-way northbound and southbound lanes. On the perimeter of the traffic circle were two venerable churches, the stately courthouse and a public library that resembled a Greek temple. Yet the most imposing structure was a field stone cube that sparkled in the sunlight. Originally, the Klingenschkun mansion it was now a small theater for plays and concerts. Its gardens paid for parking. The four-stall carriage house was still there, and the apartment above was occupied by a woman who took special orders for meatloaf, macaroni and cheese, and other freezables for a bachelor's larder. Okay. Don't you dare fucking shit on bachelors. Meatloaf and mac and cheese is the goddamn shit. The shit. At the rear of the parking lot, Quilleran's brown van passed through an ornamental iron gateway into an ancient grove of evergreens so dense that all was dark and silent, even in midday. Suddenly, the drive opened into a clearing where a huge structure, more than a hundred years old, loomed like an enchanted castle. This was Quilleran's barn, octagonal and four stories high. Sheesh. It's a fucking huge-ass fucking barn. The first story was the original fieldstone foundation, with walls so thick that small windows cut in the stone looked like crossbow ports in a medieval fort. Above the foundation, the walls were shingled with weathered wood, and the octagonal roof was centered with a... C cupola? Cupola? Mm. <laughs> Thesaurus. New windows cut in the walls had odd shapes dictated by the massive interior timbers bracing the structure. Then there were the doors. In its heyday, this had been a drive through barn, with doors large enough for a farm wagon and a team of horses. 
Now the two large openings were filled with glass panels and doors of human scale. A formal double door faced east, leading from the foyer. A single door in the west connected the barnyard with the kitchen. The interior was even more spectacular. As renovated by an architect from down below, it featured a continuous ramp that spiraled up to the roof, connecting balconies on three levels. In the central open space, which soared a good 40 feet, stood a huge white fireplace cube with white cylindrical stacks rising to the roof. The cube divided the main floor into lounge area, library, dining room, and foyer. Though not especially designed to be cat-friendly, that was what the barn proved to be. The cube, a good eight feet high, was a safe perch just beyond human reach. The ramp was made to order for a 50-yard dash. Before each meal, eight thundering paws spiraling to the top and down again. Odd-shaped windows admitted triangles and rhomboids of sunlight that tantalized the cats by moving throughout the day. Arriving home, Quilleran parked his van in the barnyard and checked the antique sea chest that stood at the back door and served for package deliveries. It was empty. He stood with his hand on the doorknob as he had a moment's qualms about his housemates. Were they all right? Had they wrecked the interior in a fit of catly exuberance? Would they meet him with a yowling welcome and waving tails? When he entered the kitchen, the premises were hushed, with no visible signs of life. Coco, yum yum. He shouted three times with increasing concern before starting a search. Circling the main floor counterclockwise, he stopped short when he reached the foyer. You rascals, he said with relief and rebuke. You gave me a scare. The two elegant Siamese were standing on their hind legs, gazing out the low-silled windows that flanked the front door. They were watching a congregation of seven black crows just outside the glass. They had never seen such birds at such close range. Briefly, they turned glassy eyes toward the person who had called their names, but they were still under the spell of those creatures who strutted in unison like a drill team. All seven to the north, then right about face, and all seven to the south. I've brought you guys a treat, Quilleran said. Reluctantly, they moved away from their posts and followed him to the kitchen, walking stiffly on long, slender brown legs. When they reached the sunlight streaming through the west windows, their fawn fur glistened with iridescence, and their dark brown masks framed brilliant blue eyes. Suddenly, black noses twitched, brown ears pricked forward, and whip-like brown tails waved in approval. Turkey. It was diced and served on separate plates. Then Quilleran produced a white canvas tote bag with the logo of the Pickaxe Public Library and announced, All aboard! He lowered it to the floor and spread the handles. Coco was the first to jump in, settling down in the bottom and making himself as compact as possible. Yum Yum followed, landing on top of him. After some good-natured shifting and squirming, they settled in, and other items were tucked in around them. It was the easiest, quickest, safest way to transport two indoor cats, some reading matter, and a coffee thermos to the gazebo. It was only a few yards from the barn, a freestanding octagonal structure screened on all eight sides. It had been the landscaper's idea to introduce a bird garden to the scrubby barnyard. We don't have many birds around here. Quilleran had told him, questioning the proposal. Start an avian garden, and they will come, the enthusiastic young man assured. The cats will flip their whiskers. What they like best is the movement of the birds, the flitting, swooping, hopping, and tail twitching. So Quilleran gave the okay, and Kevin Dune brought in selected trees and shrubs, some tall grasses, three bird feeders, and two bird baths, one on a pedestal and the other at a ground level. The birds came, 
the Siamese, were ecstatic. Quilleran reported the success of the gazebo to Polly Duncan when they talked on the phone in the early evening. She thanked him for the groceries and complimented him on his choice of produce. Mrs. Toodle gets all the credit, he said. I don't know zucchini from a cucumber. How does one not know a zucchini from a cucumber? I they think taste and they look so different. They're incredibly different looking. And tasting. Zucchinis are like, uh cucumbers are like, yeah. Like <laughs> I don't know. I get this. I mean, I like zucchinis, but like it, I'm gonna eat a cucumber over the zucchini. Oh, indeed. Like I kinda I I get the whole I mean I don't really get it, but like I get the whole thing of like a dude that's like Oh, shucks, I don't really know shit. But, like, I guess I'm sick of how it's just, like, so dumb always. Because you'll always do this comparison of, I don't know a blank from a blank. And it's always something that, like, in whatever category it is, most people would know the fucking difference from. Well, and, like, cucumbers don't have, like, little hats. Well, I well, they, as well. yeah, or crowns, I yeah. Guess. Is that? And like, I'm just saying, like, I mean, like, so movies are like, I wouldn't know Picasso from pretty much as they would describe it, like a fucking work from Sesame Street or something, and you're like, okay, pretty sure you might know the difference. Which one looks better? I don't know. Like, it, it's a trope that I just don't enjoy. <laughs> What did you have for dinner, dear? Polly asked, always concerned about his casual eating habits. I thought some macaroni and cheese. Fuck it. You should have a salad. Fuck. Yeah, as well. You, but both. How about a salad and macaroni and cheese, bitch? I'll leave the salads to you and the rabbits. His tone became stern. Oh, but, you know, stop. No, we got a fucking straight man saying that you can't eat salads unless you're a rabbit or a woman. That's true. I guess we have to drink for straight man shit. Yeah, we gotta drink for all straight man shit. Mm. <laughs> Good luck. I do hate that. Like, for one. Men salad. eat lettuce. Men eat lettuce. For one. <laughs> for two. I mean, salads are fucking yummy. And salads can also be masculine. That so, was going to be mine for three, is that like... <laughs> like, what is a salad? I mean, like, let's look at the actual world of spending money and buying salads. Like, if you go to most restaurants and most fast food places and most anywhere that you can actually buy a made salad from... Mm -hmm. It's usually some, like, chopped the fuck full of meat fucking salad, you know? Like, I mean, you can't even eat a Caesar without chicken. Yeah, gross. Then you have, like, Disasters. BLT salads. You have, like, barbecue chicken salads. You've got, like, most salads have, like, a shitload of fucking meat. And then if you're really fucking gross, there's, of course, what, the chef salad? Which is like 2% lettuce and 98% disgusting cold cuts. His tone became stern. Did you take your 20 minute walk today, Polly? I didn't have time, but my bird club meets at the clubhouse tonight and I'll go early and use the treadmill in the gym. Her voice was soft and low and she had a gentle laugh that he found both soothing and stimulating. Oh! <laughs> Drink for had a moment of grossness. Ugh. Stimulating. Ugh, I hate it. No one uses that word <laughs> in a non disgustingly sexual manner. Yeah. And no, ugh. no, no, bye. Bye bye. He liked to keep her talking. Oh, so he can stimulate himself oh, more. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course you do. Of course you do. Of course you do. Mm. Any excitement at the library today? He asked. Any anti-computer demonstrations? Any riots? <laughs> what? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
Under Polly's direction, the library had recently been automated, thanks to a Klingon Shown grant. But many subscribers disliked the electronic catalog. They preferred to make inquiries at the desk and be escorted to the court and be escorted to the card catalog by a friendly Kirk clerk who probably attended their church and might even be engaged to marry the son of someone they knew. I feel like attended their church was just good enough. Yeah, and that was just... To, they're trying to establish the smart hand right? I understand. I, I, but apparently it's India now, and, and now everyone is betrothed. Fuck me, man. That was pickaxe style. The barcode scanner and the mouse were alien and suspect. On the phone, Polly said to Quilleran, We need to schedule some hands on workshops for subscribers, uh, especially the older ones. What did you do with the old card catalog? He asked. It's in the basement. I suppose we'll... Don't throw it out. He interrupted. Come the revolution, you can move it back upstairs. Someday the pencil pushers will rise up and overthrow the computer heads and sanity will return. Oh, Quill. She laughed. You're on your soapbox again. What did you do today when you weren't pushing a pencil? She knew he drafted his twice-weekly column in longhand while sitting in a lounge chair with his feet propped on an ottoman. I picked up an old copy of The Day of the Locust in mint condition. If you're in the mood for scathing comedy, we might read a portion aloud this weekend. We, where would you like to have dinner Saturday night? How about Onisha's? I'm hungry for Mediterranean. Changing her tone, she said, I heard something bizarre today. So, uh, you in town 3000, and, and there's there's a Mediterranean restaurant? That's pretty fucking lucky. That's that's so unrealistic. Don't. I, I don't know where you are. Maybe. Bro, this, I've got as a donut and Thai food place and a <laughs> completely dilapidated and completely closed Mexican place. Oh, yeah, and then guy, another shit-ass Tex-Mex place, so... This guy fucking posted a picture of tacos, and I was super sad. I'm just tacos. Well, that's the horrible thing, is that <laughs> the photos of the tacos from that place don't look bad, but after having what we had, I'm worried they taste like shit. They probably do, and they're probably beans. Well, no, there aren't... No, I've seen the photos of the tacos. They look... They probably hide the beans. <laughs> they hide the beans. <laughs> It's just like the tiniest layer. It's like a fucking pencil width just underneath everything. We put those anyway. <laughs> I heard something bizarre today. You know the old Coggin farmhouse on Trevlin Road? Someone painted the front of it with the word witch. Yes, I know. The editor thought it wise to keep it out of the paper. How did you find out? He asked as if he didn't know. The library was, and always had been, the Central Intelligence Agency of the Community. My assistant's daughter belongs to the Handy Helpers, and they were called in to obliterate the graffiti. The sheriff spotted it on his early morning patrol and alerted them. The paint was gone, I, I believe, before Mrs. Coggin knew it was there. Quilleran had once written a column about the enthusiastic band of volunteers recruited through all the churches. Some had technical skills, others were simply young people with energy and strong backs. When household emergencies confronted the poor, the aged, or the infirm, the crisis squad was geared to respond on the double. Have you ever met Mrs. Coggins? Polly asked. No, but I caught a glimpse of her in her backyard. Not many signs of life around there, except for chickens and dogs. She's in her 90s, but smart and spunky, they say. I suppose she's considered eccentric, but the nature of the vandalism, vandalism was scurrilous. You can't read. No, I can't, because I don't like bitches that use the thoruses, man. Oh yeah, drink for every time someone, you know, uses the thoruses. Too much. 
Like, you just know it, dude. Like, no one talks like this. No one, no one, no one. I literally only use the sources when I'm trying to look for another word that I can then put into a translator to get whatever foreign language version of it. Because I think it sounds cool. Yeah, because, and That's it. No one talks like this. The language is just... I, I hate English. I literally hate English. I hate English. It's going on fucking record. I English is English. shit. English is shit. And that's it. <laughs> that's all I can say. As Quilleran listened, he was stroking his mustache slowly. Jesus Christ, got a drink. He's oh my God, I just... Oh, he's smoking. That's actually he's smoking. Yep, he's smoking his mustache. Oh. It rips out pieces, sticks it in a goddamn pipe, smokes it. I don't know, what are you up. talking about? You just, you just light it up like this? <laughs> As Quilleran listened, he was stroking his mustache slowly, a gesture meaning his suspicions were being alerted. There might be more to the accusatory epithet than met the eye. I'm refusing to drink to that. I'm just going to slap myself. His career in journalism had taught him one thing. There's always a story behind the story. Polly said, but I must stop blabbling and go to the clubhouse. Although I find walking on that treadmill a colossal bore, it's good for you, he reminded her. And salads are good for you, dear. A uh, bien toi. A uh, bien ta. Quillerain cradled the receiver slowly and fondly. No one else had ever been concerned about his diet. For that matter, had he ever been concerned about anyone's cardiovascular system. In front of him was a wall of bookshelves covering the fireplace cube and filled with pre-owned volumes from Eddington Smith's dusty bookshop. The sight of their mellow spines, like the sound of Polly's mellow voice, always pleased him. He agreed with Francis Bacon. Old friends to trust, old wood to burn, old authors to read. The titles were arranged in categories. And Coco liked to nestle in snug spaces between biography and drama, or between history and fiction. Occasionally, he raised his nose to sniff the fish glue used in old bindings. Sometimes he pushed a book off the shelf. It would land on the floor with a thunk, and he would peer over the edge of the shelf to view his accomplishment. That was Quilleran's cue to pick it up and read a few pages aloud, savoring familiar words and thoughts, while the Siamese enjoyed hearing a familiar voice. He had a full, rich voice for reading aloud. Strangely, the titles the cat dislodged often had prophetic significance, or so it seemed. It could be coincidence. Yet, Several hours before the ba vandals branded the old woman a witch, Coco had shoved The Crucible, an Arthur Miller play, off the shelf. Why would he choose that particular moment to draw attention to a work about the Salem witchcraft trials? Coco never did anything without a motive, and the incident gave Quilleran an urge to visit Mrs. Coggan. Drink for people who have cats? No, too much. Chapter 2 As a journalist, Quilleran was interested in newsworthy characters. As one who had never known his grandparents, he was drawn to octogenarians and nonagenarians. What? I don't know what the actual living fuck those words mean. I'm dumb. Drinking for again. <laughs> Drink probably when you're dumb. The dumb and or, like I said, thesaurus probably stuff. Like, I do. Thesaurus is dumb. I'm sure everyone would be like, <laughs> you don't know what I mean. It's like an old person fetish. <laughs> probably exactly me. <laughs> that was reason enough to visit Mrs. Coggan. Another incentive was Coco's cavalier treatment of the crucible. While Quilleran was feeding the Siamese the next morning, he began to wonder how the aged eccentric would react to a casual visit from a stranger. There was no listing for her in the telephone directory. Just dropping in, or stopping by, was customary in the North Country, but not in Quilleran's book. He still had some city blood in his veins. Nevertheless, he rationalized. 
On the roadside across from her house, there was a newspaper sleeve as well as a rural mailbox. All residents over 90 received a free subscription to the Moose County something. If she read it, she could recognize his mustache. <laughs> it appeared at the head of his column every Tuesday and Friday and was better known in Moose County than George Washington's wig on the $1 bill. You know, that's a lot to unpack. Like, yeah, they, this they is a like... column in a newspaper, and apparently his fucking photo is just right there on the front of every column. That's kind of narcissistic, but okay. I just see him being like this. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, like her. <laughs> so, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but he's doing this. <laughs> A token of neighborliness, such as muffins from the Scottish bakery, might be in order. How does that sound, Coco? He asked the cat who was concentrating on his breakfast. Yargle came the reply as Coco tried to swallow and comment at the same time. In mid-morning, Quilleran set out from the barn carrying a baker's box tied with red plaid ribbon. He said goodbye to the cats, told them where he was going, and estimated when he would return. The more you talk to cats, he believed, the smarter they became. <laughs> okay, okay, I can jive, I can jive with that. Uh, I don't think they become smarter, I think they respect humans. Yeah, but you know, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine, humans, Ugh, I hate them. Coco was disturbingly smart. Quilleran called him a fine fellow and had a great deal of respect for him. Yum Yum was a dainty little female with winning ways and a fondness for laps, the contents of wastebaskets, and small shiny objects she could hide under the rug. He gave them some parting instructions. Don't answer the phone. Don't pull the plug on the refrigerator. Don't open the door to poll takers. They looked at him <laughs> blankly. <laughs> it's fucking hilarious. Yes! <laughs> I love this. Yeah, we got a sarcastic writer. <laughs> From the barn, a narrow lane led east to the country highway, a matter of a few tenths of a mile. It wound through the bird garden, then a meadow that had once been a blighted apple orchard, then an age-old grove, grove of evergreen and hardwoods. At the end, fronting on Tre Trevelon Road, was the two-acre plot where Polly had been building a house until health problems forced her to abandon the project. Fortunately, the Klingenschun Foundation took it off her hands and gave it to the local art community as a center for exhibitions and related activities. The new art center had a residential air, being sided with the stained cedar popular in the North Country. As Quilleran walked past, he found everything ship shape for the official opening, except the driveway and parking lot. These paved areas were crisscrossed with brown mud tracked in from the highway. Trevelyan Road was used chiefly by farmers, and mud from the fields was transferred to the pavement by truck tires and tractor treads, thence to the art center premises. Officers of the Arts Council had drawn the condition to the attention of county officials, but what could be done? In farming country, mud happens. Yet, the new manager of the art center had written an irate letter to the newspaper, a move that brought angry replies from the agricultural sector. Across the road from the handsome new building was a dilapidated farmhouse surrounded by a hundred acres of well-tilled farmland. The house was sadly neglected and would have appeared abandoned but for the chickens pecking around the wheels of a rusty truck in the front yard. As Quilleran approached, five elderly mongrels limped and waddled from behind the house. What? Yeah. <laughs> Good dogs. Good dogs. He said as he headed for the front stoop. Oh, oh, <laughs> I have. <laughs> I, I know, you're imagining like these old people just hobbling out and you're like, what the fuck? Sorry. No, that was my first opinion too, and then I was like, oh. No, you guys are dogs. I was seeing zombies. Okay. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> they followed him with the benign curiosity, too tired or too old to bark. Nevertheless, the front door was flung open, and a scrawny woman in strange clothing screeched, 
Who be you? Quilleran raised the bakery box and replied in pleasant voice, A messenger from the Moose County something, bringing a present to one of our favorite readers. Lass almighty, she exclaimed. I dare it be the mustache from the paper. Look it. <laughs> That's my soul. <laughs> Come on in and have a sup. There be a pot of coffee boiling, boil, boil, boiling, boiling on the stove. <laughs> what? what? Although I'm, I, I know she's saying boiling, but when I spell it B apostrophe I L I N, I don't think boiling. I think billing or boiling. Boiling. It's boiling. Good. Do you not know how to be fucking country? I know how to speak country. Boiling. I don't know how to read it when it's written like that. <laughs> oh, that's gay. <laughs> I can see that. There be a pot of coffee boiling on the stove. She spoke in a local patois common among old timers in the area. Polly was doing research on Old Moose and as an almost forgotten dialect. Quilleran was glad he had brought his tape recorder. The entrance hall was totally dark. Groping blindly in her wake, he found himself in a large, dusty, cluttered kitchen. Besides a pot-bellied stove, pots and pans, and a dry sink with hand pump, there were such furnishings as a narrow cot, a chest of drawers, and a large, old-fashioned Morris chair with torn upholstery. Yeah, it sounds like her house. This was where she lived, with an exclamation point, so as to say, it's they trash. probably have a problem with it. <laughs> it literally sounds like her house. <laughs> but we don't have a pump sink. She cleared, rolled up newspapers, and assorted litter from a wooden table and a scarred wooden chair. Sit ye down, she invited as she poured coffee from an enameled tin pot into thick china mugs with chipped handles. It had been boiling on a kerosene heater. The cast iron stove, not needed in this weather, was piled high with rolled up newspapers. Quilleran said, I hope you like these muffins, Mrs. Coggin. They are carrot and raisin. She bit into one with good teeth, large but discolored. So they be. Ain't had nothing so fancy since Burke passed on. That were twenty year ago. Living alone, body gets to living mighty plain. He were seventy eight. Burke were when he passed on. I be ninety three. <laughs> you don't look it, Quilleran said. There's something youthful about you. She was indeed spirited and agile. Yep. Can read the paper without glasses, never had no store bought teeth, live off the land and work hard, that be the ticket. Woo woo! <laughs> Drink for a country represent! <laughs> Yet her face was furrowed and leathery, and her scant white hair was untamed. The wild aspect, plus her screeching voice and odd attire, could easily give rise to gossip. In spite of the mild weather and glowing kerosene heater, she was wearing a long, heavy skirt over farmer's work pants, topped with layers of men's shirts and sweaters. Is this just me? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> she clomped around the raw wood floor in 16 eyelet field boots, somewhat too large. How long were you married, Mrs. Coggin? Never. <laughs> 60 year. This, is, this be Bert's chair. She flopped down in the Morris chair and propped her boots on a wooden crate. And these be Bert's boots. Have you had this land all that time? One acre. We started with. Worked it together. Didn't have a horse. I pulled the plow. I were young then. I be 93 now. Do my own chores. Grow my own turnips and kale. Drive my own truck. But how do you cultivate all this acreage, Mrs. Coggin? Some young lads be tilling it since Bert passed on. Hundred acres all the ways back to the river. With them big machines, it ain't like it were. Good lad they be. Paid me rent they did for twenty year, without missing a month. I think I know them. The McBee brothers. Don't rent the land no more. Sold the whole caboodle. No more taxes to pay, and I can live here without paying rent. This new feller loves the soil, he does, like Bert did. He's gonna plant food crops, taters and beans, not just hay and field corn. Sounds like a good deal. Have you always lived in this area, Mrs. Coggin? Nope. Growed up in Little Hope. Then you probably know Homer Tibbet. The retired high school principal was now official county historian. Yep. Lived on the next farm. 
set my cap for that boy. I did, but he up and went away to school, so I married Bert. He were a good farmer and a good man. Give me three boys, he did. All moved away now. No telling where they be. Passed on, maybe. Yeah, oh, fuck, <laughs> I love this man. <laughs> Don't even care. You probably have great-grandchildren. She shrugged. Don't know where they be. Quilleran glanced at the hand pump in the kitchen sink. He counted four oil lamps. I don't see any electric lights. Don't need none. Do you have a telephone? Nope. Waste the money. Want more coffee? He declined politely. Though notorious for his powerhouse coffee, Quilleran was floored by the thick brew that had been boiling on the kerosene heater all morning. What do you think of your new neighbors across the street? He asked. A plague on them. They'd be writing letters to the paper about mud. It'd be good, honest farm dirt, and we'd be tracking it for 70 years. Let them take their fancy stuff and go somewhere else. They'd come in here with all them cars, polluting the air, and bothering my hens. Artists, they say they be. Likely drawing pictures of folks without clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> this bitch is the best. I love this book. This book is fucking bomb. I mean, what the fuck was that cat book? It's so horrible. And it had nothing to do with the cat. Like, Both of these books. I, 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 I hate it because I, I feel like it's code. I feel like there's a code of like cat books and it's like witches. Cause yeah, this not shit. That other one though. No, 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 no. That's what I mean. I feel like other people try or don't know what it actually means, and then, so they try. This shit is so sassy. I love it. And like the fact that the book was not just like, like I guess you have to be destroyed by cats or by your own ego to write a book like because this and the fucking hand of the fucking book. It, it, beautiful. And like, obviously beautiful. these books are just like that. But the worst part about that book is, along with those books, that book was the first in a fucking series. Why the fuck would I want to read more? Both of these books, within the first two chapters, have well described their cats and have shown they actually give a fuck about them. <laughs> like, don't unplug the refrigerator. <laughs> if fuck are you? <laughs> like, who... The fuck writes a cat book with two cats and it's just like, they curl up on the bed, they eat kibble. Yeah, that is what cats do. They also do a shitload more things. Why don't I write about you? You went to work. You're a fucking hag. Yeah. Just, you know, characters written well. Not being a racist piece of shit and writing a fucking murder. Uh, just a black being a fucking guy. black kid that had literally no description I just or anything in the whole book. More the villain. What? I saw both the black kids were the villains. Yeah, both the poorest fucking... Oh, I forgot they were poor, too. That was yeah, like... they were fucking poor, Is most fun? illiterate, and fucking oh, black. Right. Fuck. It's hard for me to get through the other book. I'm gonna read it, maybe. I hate it. I just really hate I, the fucking it, style. It, it, it reminds you of the, the gay version of the erotica. Like I said, it's not bad for an erotica. But it's an erotica, so I don't exactly want to read it. Well, it's not just that. Like, it's just... <laughs> I'm not trying to pull to some, learn. like, literary gatekeeping or something, but, like, please write somewhat like a person. Like, don't be like, oh, well, it's from my perspective. Fucking K. Um, when I write it from my perspective, or if I write a character to be writing a journal or any fucking thoughts... I don't make them as retarded as fucking goddamn Huckleberry Finn was. Like, why is it just shit some fucking with just fucking words, period, <laughs> words, period, words, period, words, period, words, period, words, period, sex, 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 words, period, words, period, words, period. And then, oh, wow, I'm so fucking interesting. I threw bigotry in there because it's the fucking 70s. Like, you went to a YMCA once. That's why you gave them a fucking gratification of getting a thing. And then you were like. Yay! Oh, wait, that was glad that he gave gratification too. But, like, I don't fucking care. Like, that doesn't entitle you to write a story 
about life as a gay man during the seventies, if you probably didn't even live life as a gay man in the seventies, or if you did, you maybe you could have written a better book about that probably, experience. Yes, no, you probably you no. Know, that, that's why I literally compared it to what the fuck. Um, when she was freaking red, because it it it's just a fucking erotica. It's just as fucking slim. It's just as fucking shitty. I just, like, I want to continue, because some, you know, the, one of the other faggots, I'm saying that because he's one of the ones writing the gay book as well. There's a, another gay book that he did for yeah. the series. I was like... Says it's really good yeah, and really fast. Yeah, like an Instagram comment being like, ha ha ha, I'm supporting my friend. I know, it's just, it says it goes really fast, so I'm like, okay, well maybe at like a fucking chapter two in it'll pick up a pace and not be so shitty, but like, I need writing style... That doesn't literally feel like I'm an old person almost looking at something so far away in my own eyesight because I need glasses. Like, pretty much is that bad where I'm like, is that what I'm reading because I just, it is an actual chore to get through the words. Quilla Rand said, I'm hoping we'll be able to live together in peace. Well, I ain't gonna write no letters to the paper. Me, I mind my own business. I be 93. <laughs> Oh, yeah. It's officially a drinking job, or game. Every time she says she's 93, which has been three times now, so far, possibly four times. If 93! Right. <laughs> Every time she says she's 93, drink. <laughs> Your dogs are very friendly. Poor old things, nobody wants them. They come around, starving and shivering. I give them a blanket in the shed and something to eat. Do they have names? I call them Blackie, Spot, Dolly, Mabel, and Lil Yaller. Holy yes, sir. Shit. <laughs> That's a lot. Five stray dogs. Hell yeah. I mean, I got ten stray cats, so... Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. When I pass on, I believe in my money to take care of poor old dogs. All I want, I want a tombstone next to Bert's and the words I want on it to be my old coggin. Worked hard, loved animals, mound her own business. <laughs> Dude, I love this fucking bitch. This bitch is my spirit animal. <laughs> fucking queen. I love her. Fuck it. Pooter. Pooter. With assorted reactions, Quilleran walked away from the Coggin farm. He hoped there was no feud brewing between the art community and the farmers. He knew Polly would appreciate the bucolic philosophy and old moose vernacular, which he had taped surreptitiously. He wondered if he should send a case of dog food to the Coggin shelter for poor old dogs. It was too early for the newspaper delivery, but he stopped at his mailbox on the side of the road. There were few letters. Business correspondence went to a post office box and was handled by a secretarial service. Fan mail went to the newspaper office. In the art center parking lot, the large number of cars prompted him to go in and investigate. He found a light interior with walls and vinyl floors in the pale neutral compatible with art. Volunteers were setting up the opening exhibit in two galleries. There was also a room with chairs and tables for classes and sliding glass doors opening to a patio. Down a hall were studios with north light an office for the manager, and stairs leading to a future gallery on the lower level. Most of the helpers were middle-aged women in blue denim smocks with the Art Center logo. There was one man on a stepladder, however, adjusting the track lights under the supervision of a business-like young woman. Higher! Higher! She said, waving her arms. Now, a little to the left! Catching a glimpse of Quilleran, she rushed to his side and her expression changed from stern to hospitable. You're Mr. Q, aren't you? She said, I'm Beverly Forfar, the manager. Even while being pleasant, she looked formidable, owing to the severe haircut that fitted her head like a helmet. Straight dark hair covered her ears and eyebrows. She waved an arm around the interior. We have you to thank for all this, Mr. Q. Don't thank me. Thank those eggheads at the K Fund he said. Do you think you'll be ready in time for the Sunday opening? Absolutely, even if the entire crew has to work around the clock. Answer one question, Miss Forfar. 
How do galleries hang and rehang exhibits without leaving holes in the wall? Oh my god. It's very simple. Our walls are plywood covered with carpet. The nails go into the plywood and the carpet weave conceals the holes. Well, learn something every day. Don't let me keep you from your work. I'm only snooping. Will you be covering the opening for the paper? No. Roger McGilvery is assigned. But I'll be here with friends. I hope you're having refreshments. He added playfully. Oh, definitely. Taking him seriously, she enumerated the two kinds of punch and seven kinds of sweets before returning to the exhibit space. Okay, but is the punch booze? <laughs> is it gonna pack a punch? <laughs> the man on the stepladder, no one Quilleran knew, was waiting patiently with the bemused attitude of a volunteer. He had a distinguished appearance with a shock of white hair that was hard to overlook and gold-rimmed glasses that gave his eyes a friendly look. Now, the other bank of lights, Miss Forfar instructed him, pointing and gesturing. Bring them all down. First one to the left, other straight ahead. No, that one slightly to the right and higher, higher. Not so high, slightly to the left. The white-haired helper turned to look at her, caught Quilleran's eye, smiled, and shrugged and Quilleran composed an original Chinese proverb. Man on ladder, directed by woman below. Not good. <laughs> Still, he decided the manager was an attractive woman in her way, buxom but slim-hipped. No blue denim smock for her. She was wearing a bright yellow jumpsuit. As he ambled toward the studios, he heard a loud male voice saying irritably, What did they hope to accomplish? They made fools of my kids, and my daughter has a weak heart. She could have had an attack. What was it all about? Another man said quietly, without any real show of interest. Quilleran maneuvered an oblique sightline into the studio and glimpsed an artist working at an easel while his subject sat in a chair on a raised platform. The subject, who had trouble sitting well, was Chester Ramsbottom a county commissioner and owner of a restaurant, a chesty man with thinning hair and an air of authority. I'll tell you what it was all about, he said belligerent, belligerently. It was a stupid boondoggle, all fake, and the taxpayers will have to foot the bill. They never consulted me about any of this, and I'd like to know why. They duped the kids into watching this fake accident, and they fell for it. It was an insult to their intelligence, and by God, I'm going to investigate. Ah, oh, shut your big yap, knucklehead, came a raucous voice from the next studio. Who said that? The commissioner blurted, half rising from his chair. Whoops, dearie, came the voice, followed by a wolf whistle. <laughs> Quilleran moved quietly to the adjoining studio and saw a young woman at a drawing board covering her face with her hands to stifle her giggles. In a large cage was a parrot green bird with a touch of red on his tail. He was blinking and rocking on his perch. Oh. Pretty Polly, Quilleran said to himself. Pretty Polly. Buck off, knucklehead, came the impolite reply. The artist jumped up and threw a blanket over the cage. I'm sorry, you're Mr. Q, aren't you? He doesn't like to be called Polly. His name is Jasper. Is he yours? The question was asked in disbelief. She was a diminutive young woman, rather like a 12-year-old, and there was an innocence in her large brown eyes. My boyfriend gave him to me, and my mom won't let me have pets at home, so I'm keeping him here until I can get an apartment. Quilleran glanced around the room. All the studios had narrow ledges on the side walls for displaying art, framed or unframed. Here, the ledges were filled with butterfly paintings, on a side table, he noted a butterfly guidebook, a ceramic vase covered with butterflies in low relief, and a bowl of peanuts. So you're the butterfly girl, he said. Do you object to being called that? No, I really like it, she said. Do you like butterflies? Actually, I've never paid much attention to them, he said. But my cats like to see them flitting around. We don't have any like these in my backyard. The paintings on display were about the size of an average book, each with a brilliant butterfly flat out and another of the same species with wings folded back, resting on a twig or sipping nectar from a flower. 
the artist explained. People prefer exotics, like the Paris peacock and the red lacewing. The black and white one is a tailed emperor, and if you look closely, you can see smidgens of blue, brown, orange, and maroon in the wings. Hmm, he said, for want of a more intelligent response. A lot of people make collections, specializing in blues or swallowtails or hair streaks. They commissioned me to paint certain ones. It's a lot of fun. I imagine so, he said. Well, well, that's a beautiful vase. Do you like it? The butterfly girl said with eyes gleaming. That's my inspiration. My grandmother sent it from California. Do you mind if I uncover Jasper? The man next door is gone, I think. She moved gracefully to the cage with the dancer's posture, and Quilleran noted that her hair was piled tightly in a ballerina's topknot. As soon as the cage was uncovered, Jasper squawked, Give me a peanut, monkey! Give me a peanut! Who trained this bird? Quilleran asked. I don't know. My boyfriend bought him at a bird show down below. He has a murderous beak. I wouldn't want to meet him in a dark alley. He's an Amazon hookbill. They're supposed to be very intelligent. He may have a high IQ, but his vocabulary needs to be cleaned up. Same to you, knucklehead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm drinking for birds being shit. I love it. <laughs> Shaking his head in amused disbelief, Quilleran said goodbye to the butterfly girl and returned to the portrait studio, where the artist now sat alone. He had a bifurcated beard that gave him a comic look and twinkling eyes that suggested he had no objection to painting fools. Hi. Quilleran Hi. wondered how Ramsbottom would be depicted as an arrogant county boss or a genial purveyor of barbecue sandwiches. Oh, -ho! that's a way to say the man's fat. <laughs> Sastrink. You must be Paul Scumble, he said. I'm Jim Quilleran. We've never met, but I commissioned you to do a double portrait for a wedding gift last winter. I remember well. That was a sad case. I'm sorry it didn't work out. It would have been a challenge. Are you relocating in Moose County? No. My home studio, my home and studio are still in Lockmaster, but I have several commissions up here and I'm renting the studio on a temporary basis. I'd like to have a portrait of a friend of mine, a librarian. I'd like her to be seated, holding a book. Would you be interested? I think so. I'm very good at books. Some people say I paint books better than I paint faces. His face crinkled with humor. He had a face that crinkled easily. Will you be here on Sunday? I'd like you two to meet. Is she willing to sit for a portrait? I don't copy photographs. Painting from life has a rich tonality that can't be faked. She'll sit. Trust me, Quilleran said. Some people don't like to spend the time. Leave it to me. <laughs> Pooter. As Quilleran was leaving the building, he beckoned Beverly Forfar away from her duties. How many visitors do you expect on Sunday? We provide refreshments for 300. I just hope we don't run out of punch. The open house is scheduled from 1 to 5 o'clock. Wouldn't it be awful if they all came at once? Where will they park after the lot is filled? On both sides of Trevelyan Road. We have permission, and the sheriff will monitor the situation. She assumed a grim expression, accentuated by the severity of her long, straight bangs. Mr. Q, can anything be done about that eyesore across the road? Fuck off, bitch. Move into a country land? Look at a country home. Fuck off. <laughs> the farmhouse? If I were an artist, I'd consider it picturesque. Hell yeah. He answered evasively. That's right. Hell That's yeah. right. That's fucking right, bitch. That's yeah. fucking right. It might be if it didn't have that junk truck in the front yard oh, and those you. ratty dogs and chickens. They're always running out on the highway. They could cause accidents. Oh, I thought dogs God. were supposed to be tied up. Yeah, maybe rabbit dogs. Only within the city limits, Quilleran said. This building is in Pickaxe, but the farmhouse is in the township, and there's no rural ordinance. 
And how about the mud, Mr. Q? It gets trapped on our parking lot and then into the building. Unfortunately, Miss Forfar, this is farming country, and it's spring. In the growing season, it won't be such a problem. Well, something should be done about it before it ruins our floors, she said vehemently. Pooter. Whoa, 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 fuck it. Yeah. Really? Fucking country cat, fucking book. Love it! Also, like, again, such a, like, old, witchy, haggy cat thing to do. Like, you love art. You're a writer. But you shit on artists because you know the fucking modern artists that are sitting inside making a center of some old building that they couldn't even afford to fix up. Maybe. hate fucking country shit because they just took their poor little asses down bought it out from the fucking bank and then are like uh oh, but the country you fucking bought it you fucking moved there and that's what fucking shit artists are like not a goddamn surprise in the world i just love that anytime i ever see like hatred of art i'm like haha you've dealt with those people you've dealt with those pieces of shit jesus love it wow that's great <laughs> On the perimeter of the art center, at the beginning of the lane to Quilloran's barn, a new sign read Private Drive. It had been installed just in time. Otherwise, 300 visitors to the open house would tramp up the lane to look at the fabulous structure. The public had always been curious about the barn. Six months before, it had been the scene of a charity cheese tasting party, with guests paying $300 apiece to what? attend the black tie event. Um, drink for if you'd ever spend that, you're dumb, and drink for if you wouldn't spend that, cheers, because fuck off, what? They were still talking about it, not so much because of the architecture or the 22 cheeses, but because Coco, in his inimitable way, had stolen the show. Concerning the new sign, Polly had questioned whether it would be enough to discourage sightseers. If not, we'll add beware of vicious animals, Quilloran had told her. And if that doesn't work, we'll have to resort to a moat and drawbridge. It's not that I'm being antisocial. I simply don't want strangers peering in the windows at the cats and getting ideas. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. What? Well, they want to eat them? They want to rape them? I don't know what that means. They want to adopt them? Vigorously? <laughs> vigorously. <laughs> Take my money. I want to vigorously adopt you guys. 